Today I'm here and I want to speak on the topic, the Christian mind, uh, the Christian mind. Uh, uh, it's very important uh, for us to know that being Christians, uh, there is a way we are supposed to think. We should, uh, there is a way our mind should be organized. There is a way uh, where our, our mental, you know, uh, world should be expressed. And that way uh, I will be speaking about the Christian mind and particularly I want to uh, zero in the place of building a healthy attitude or the place of having attitudes which are healthy. Uh, uh, life is about attitude. Life is about attitude. And uh, that way, uh, it's very important that we get to build attitudes which honor God. We build attitudes which will glorify God. We build attitudes which, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to make us the salt and the light of the earth, okay? Uh, sorry for the sound. You know, I have a big head today. I've never used this gadget. So pray for me. I'm like wondering uh, how to control my voice. But I hope you can hear me well. Okay, or I go back to the... Uh, so I, I improve myself, eh? So I'm struggling on trying to control my voice. Yeah, these are the new gadgets that the Lord gives us. Yeah, so um, why, uh, why, why, why is it important uh, for us to look at the topic attitude as Christians? Why is it important? One is that um, attitude or, or our attitudes or the attitude we have is the expression, is the language of our mentality. You know, the attitude that you possess is the expression of what goes on within your, your mind, you know? Uh, the very attitude you, you portray uh, towards people, the attitudes you portray towards events, the attitude you portray, uh, portray towards uh, uh, tasks that you're given, uh, those are actually the language of our mentality. Our attitudes, I would say, they are the language of our mentality. You know, what our mind looks like, what is going on in our mind is spoken through our attitudes, okay? And, um, and our attitudes may, may be expressed either through words, through actions, but at the end of the day, even some attitudes are expressed through gestures. You don't have to say things, but if you come into a room and uh, you, someone uh, is just looking at you, is not like excited about you. At times, uh, they, they, express, they express something. They express the unsaid. So our attitudes uh, are the language of our mentality. Uh, second thing, why is it important for us to look into this topic of attitude is that uh, it is the basis at which performance is determined. Now, you always perform, perform to, uh, you know, uh, to, to the level of your attitude towards something. If your attitude towards something tells you that this is important, definitely your actions, your performance will equally be related uh, or be directly equ be equivalent to, to, to your attitudes towards the same thing. You know, uh, if your attitude towards, uh, let's say, a particular job uh, let me use my wife. Sorry, mom. I, I'd never said I'll use this, uh, but let me use it. Uh, if you fight me, I will cry at home. They will not know. So it's still okay. <laughs> you know, I remember many years ago, uh, someone comes. Uh, we, met, we met someone. We were driving home. We were not staying at home those days. We were staying somewhere uh, near Kimumu. And so we are driving home, and we meet someone uh, on the road, and this person uh, hands me uh, a letter and tells me, oh, uh, my friend, I got this uh, from uh, the district office, and uh, it was an advert for an assistant chief. And uh, this man told me, I want you to apply. Now, me. I said, really? Do you think, you think I can become an assistant chief? You know, my attitude towards that office was really bad. 
So I just took the, uh, what is it, the, 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 the later, and uh, I was with my wife, and at that time my wife was uh, teaching somewhere, and so I didn't know that my wife got interested. But myself, I was like, really? Of all these things, do you think I, I can, want to become a, an assistant chief? So anyway, uh, down the line, after some, 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 some days and months, my wife had gone to, uh, to, to do the, the, the training where she was teaching. And while they were talking there, and someone said, uh, you know, there is, you know, I would wish I become a, as chief. And my wife hears that, and now the story comes up. And, uh, and my wife also shares with them and says, oh, I think I would want to apply. There is a, 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 vac a vacancy in, in, my, in my village. And so she comes home that weekend and tells me, what, Daddy, I want to apply for that post. I said, what? <laughs> you want to become a, a chief? Anyway, long story, I don't want to mess up with your time. You know, finally, you know, she applied. She did a late application. Interviews were called. We even did not know that interviews had been called because they were using, remember, the beer box. So we did open our, our, our mail uh, box for some time. So the interviews had been called. She was not aware. Until one day, just again, we were also... I think we were driving or she was coming somewhere and someone asked her, uh, how was the interview? And she said, which interview? And someone says, I saw your name and uh, you were shortlisted for an interview for the post of a chief. And then, oh, when was that? It was yesterday. Oh, now she tells me, go and check on our mailbox. Suppose there could be something. I went there, there was a letter that has been lying there for some days. And guess what? The interview was not done yesterday, as they were told. So the quorum, something happened and they had postponed. So, and a circular comes again that the interview was postponed. And now we were aware. And guess what? She goes for the interview after some days and she becomes a chief. <laughs> oh my. I was not a happy man. Based on what? My attitude. But today as you're talking, I now miss the office of the chief. <laughs> now she has been promoted. She's someone else. <laughs> She's no longer a chief, but she rose in rank. But I still miss the very one I did not like. I don't think I'm so excited about the new post. That is attitude. You know, we perform based on our attitudes. If you are given an assignment, the energy that you express in that assignment will be directly be equivalent with the attitude you have towards it. And so that's why I'm saying that uh, uh, attitudes uh, determine our performance. Attitude determines our performance. Uh, second, thirdly, is that why should we be interested with this topic on attitude is that it's the basis on which relationships are built. It's the basis on which relationships are built. And uh, our Christian faith is determined not by the amount of our many religious actions that we do or activities, but they are mainly really measured by our relationships. You know that? You know, Jesus said, uh, no, the Bible says, okay, let's begin with Jesus and then what the Bible says in some other places. Jesus said, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and then with all your mind. And then the second commandment is, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus puts the place of relationship very important. Our relationship with God and our relationship with one another comes very uh, comes on top when it comes to our Christianity. You are not a better Christian than your relationships. Your relationships really speaks much about your Christianity. 
Jesus, you know, the Bible says, how can we say we love the God we don't see and we hate the brother that we see? So the measure of our spirituality is greatly dependent on how we carry on our relationships. Please, brethren, it is so important that we think about our relationships. So, uh, attitudes can be in two forms. Uh, when I was thinking about this, uh, I, I, I thought uh, attitudes can be in two forms. Uh, I did not search much to know what other people are saying, but this was primarily what I saw from the scriptures and, uh, and when, while I was just thinking about life, you know? Yeah. So I realized there are two forms of attitudes. Attitudes can either be realistic or presumptive, you know? You can have attitudes that are realistic, and some attitudes are presumptive. And I'm going to just explain uh, uh, something about the two, uh, 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 you know, uh, forms of attitudes. And, and that way, how they are also formed are different. Realistic attitudes are uh, formed based on facts and experiences. Okay? Yeah, the attitude that you have, which is realistic, uh, you know, is, is mainly based on facts and what? And, and, uh, and experiences. <clears throat> Sorry. So, and in the Bible, uh, we have such a case. We have such a case of an attitude. You know, attitudes that were, were expressed in the Bible. That is in Genesis 31 verses 5 and 7. I want us to look at uh, some attitudes which are, which are formed and which are based on facts and experiences. All right? You know, the, the facts of the things you know will form a particular attitude towards either this or that thing. And if it's based on facts, if it is factual, if it is based on true and accurate experiences, then that attitude that you possess, uh, I can say it's not malicious, it's an attitude that is factual, and it's an attitude that is realistic. Now, there is this gentleman called Jacob. We know him. We know his story, how he, he, he deceived the brother and then ran away after receiving the birthright, and he ran to, to Laban. Laban was his uncle, and uh, he was there for many years, and, um, and he worked for the uncle. You remember that time? Uh, the uncle uh, has told, told him, please, now uh, I want you to work for me. And Le uh, Jacob said, uh, fine, I will work for you, but I don't need a salary. Uh, but instead, I want to get a wife, uh, to get your daughter as a wife. So we know the story. And um, something happened to him. He was should change the first time. You remember that day? Yeah, he, 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 he loved Leah. And, uh, but the very night... The very night of the wedding, Mze um, did his thing. You know, Mze did his thing and changed the children. I said, nah, wait, wait. you have to remain. This one is going to be married before you yourself. Okay. And um, so, and again in the morning, oh, uh, Jacob realized that he was your chain. He went in again for another seven years now to be given Leah. That's the story. Now, after working with this man for some time, probably many years, not less than 14 years, because we know 7-7, seven, seven, and then probably there were some other years, uh, you know, uh, there came a time of uh, evaluating, uh, you know, their relationship, the relationship between uh, Jacob and Laban. Now, over this period of time, attitudes had been formed. All right? Attitudes had been formed. And I just picked this small place just to explain that. Genesis 31, verses 5 to 7, he said to them, this is Jacob talking to his two wives, who are now the children of Laban. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before. You see? 
That's, that's not so good news to tell your wife about their family. All right? <laughs> These are sunny law <laughs> telling the wives, hey, I have something about your father. This man, I have worked with him for more than 14 years. I know him nowadays. And anytime I'm walking, I always look at the face of your father. And Jacob said, for the last few days, I see the countenance of this museum has changed. And he said, I fear that this man has changed something. His attitude towards me has, has changed. It's not what it was before. And then he says this, you know that I have worked for your father with all my strength. That is a statement of fact. All right? He's telling you, ladies, you are my wives. And you know how I have worked for your father. I wish Jacob would have gone to them there and take this information to them there. But now he's telling the, the daughters, surely. How do you feel when someone is telling you something that's not so nice about your parents? That, that's Labat, that's Jacob. <laughs> he tells the wives and who are the daughters, you people know, I worked for your father. I worked for your father with all my, my strength. And then another statement of fact. Yet your father has cheated me. <laughs> That's now the bad news. I wish he would have said, I worked for your father all these many years, and now I'm a rich man because he paid me well. But rather he says, oh, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages, how many times? My goodness, what an employer. <laughs> you write an agreement, this is the wage, and then come end month, it's not what you agreed. He changed my wages 10 times. My brother and my sister, what would, what would really form in, in, in your attitude? So, Jacob says, I have some facts here, and I see your father. He keeps changing every other time. I worked for him faithfully with all my strength, yet he has cheated on me ten, time, ten times. And so, based on this, I don't want to go, you go and read for yourself, Based on this, Jacob, Jacob had also formed what? An attitude. <laughs> but his attitude was factual. He would just lay the facts. And then now, based on this, I think my relationship with this muse has to come to an end. And can we say amen? You don't want to say amen. You are still stuck. You still want, you are being short chained and you are still saying, let me stay. Better the devil you have than the angel you don't know. My brother and my sister, there comes a time you make a decision. Say, so I'll go out to the streets. And so he says, now please, this relationship has to, to stop. It has to come to an end. And Jacob tells the, the wives, now please, I'm planning. I want us to escape and go to a place where this muse will not come again. You know what would have happened really was that uh, Jacob and Laban, <laughs> Laban would have come again, probably for their wealth. You know, by this time now, Jacob had more wealth than him. He might have, he would have come and say, okay, even your daughters are mine. All the goats are mine. The sheep is mine. Even you now, you are mine or you go the same way you came. You know that? <laughs> You know, he came empty handed. He came with a paper back, you know? And so by this time, he was blessed. Now, so attitudes can be formed based on experiences and what? And facts. And this is the best way to have our attitudes established. I would not encourage you to have the presumptive. A form of attitudes. 
The second attitude is, uh, I call it presumptive, because it's not based on, on facts, it's not based on, uh, on uh, what is it? It's not based on experiences. These attitudes are based on presumptions, and they are, uh, they are baseless, and they are also based on baseless conclusions. You know, baseless conclusions. Uh, you know, there are statements like, uh, car engines are runners. You know? Is that a statement of fact or presumptive? Is it a fact? It's both. I know the car engines who are here. Hmm? They want to say they are runners, but why are you not running? Hmm? <laughs> All right? <laughs> A presumptive thought would be, all tall people are strong. That's presumptive. And because of that, we have made what? Conclusions. These conclusions seem to be holding water, but truly they are baseless. And those conclusions form a mentality and put an attitude in us. I want to tell you a bad story about me. Uh, when I was young, I told you I was a fighter. And even to these days, the grace of God that holds me down. Hmm? <laughs> okay? <laughs> so one day, when I was a young boy, a gentleman who had been circumcised in my village, I was young, uh, you know, a gentleman in my primary school, they had been circumcised, I was young. And so he comes around. You know when those guys, when they are circumcised, they come and bully everybody in, in, in school. So I looked at him and I said, what are you trying to tell me? You know, I dared him. And I was very young. I dared him. So when I dared him, I realized now I have thrown stones to the police station. And they came running for me. They wanted to really show me, to discipline me. So anyway, I went around, tried to hide, to hide myself. But later on, the warrior in me rose up. You know, I confronted one of them. He was not expecting that I'm going to fight him. You know, I hit him to the ground. <laughs> and because I was definitely stronger and bigger than me, the only thing I would do was sit on him and not do anything. <laughs> and I was crying until the teacher came. And when the teacher came, finally I was the hero. I was on top of him. Mm? <laughs> so that was presumptive, that now that I'm circumcised, I'm strong. Who told you that? You can be beaten. All right, anyway. That's not a good story. Mm? So it, when it comes to presumptive, we have a story in the Bible. First Samuel, let's go to that. First Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28. Now, when we are talking about all these things, I want you to assess your life, your relationships, your attitude, the attitudes you have towards things. Is it based on facts or they are presumptive? Now, let's look at, at a case of whereby we had uh, this scenario. Uh, the Bible talks about this is David, and uh, the setup here is that uh, there was the battle between the Philistines and the Israelites, and you remember the story of Goliath. Uh, was, was going on there. So David uh, gets from home, goes to the field to check on the brothers, uh, courtesy of the father. The father tells David, please go down to the, to the, uh, to the battlefield and, and check on your brothers. So when David comes to the camp, he comes into to the camp of the brothers, uh, David uh, meets the soldiers. The Bible, in fact, the Bible says when you read that David took the luggage he brought and gave to a caretaker, told, them, told him or her, I'd probably him, uh, please take good care of this. Let me go and see what's going on. And so when he comes to the, bat uh, to the battle, uh, to the, what is that? Uh, to the battleground, uh, David begins to inquire from the people, what's going on here? And at that time, you know, Goliath appears, you know? What a coincidence. Goliath appears, and David hears this man talking on the other end. And then he 
asks these people, what are you people doing? You are not fighting. We, for us at home, we think you people are really fighting to the nail. But you are just seated and listening to this guy just insulting us. And so while David was still doing that, now the brother, you know, the brother is called Eliab. David's older, oldest brother, looks and realizes, what? Here is David now. Now let's see the story. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? Hey, are you, 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 have that, you know that thought? Yeah? Why have you come down? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? That is your older brother speaking. You know? He's speaking very responsibly. Why have you come here? And who did you leave the little sheep with? And now, let's look at the presumptive attitude. What does Eliab say? Can we read it? <laughs> now listen, surely. It's really bad to have presumptive attitudes and baseless conclusions. The presumptive attitude of Eliab was that David is wicked. Was David a wicked man? In fact, the Bible says he was a man after God's own. But to Eliab, this is a very wicked young boy, naughty boy. In fact, he, say, he does not say, he says, I know. It's a statement of fact based on Eliab, but it was baseless. Okay? I know, I know your wicked heart. You came down only to watch on the battle, <laughs> you know. My goodness. But uh, please, let me say this. Don't allow yourself to be put down by the attitudes of others which are baseless. Can we say amen? amen. Can we say amen? amen? Yeah, people have said you cannot amount to anything. Please tell them that's your story, but I still have a story. Amen? Listen to verse 29. David speaks. Oh, he was another warrior. Probably, I'm a little David. I've never killed a lion. You know? The warrior in David arose, and he faces Eliab and tells him, now, he defends his ground. Now, what have I done? Say, David, can't I even speak? I cannot speak in this house. Have you been in such a situation? You are in the place you really want to say something, and people, because of their presumptive attitude, are pressing you down. Please go home and speak today. Go and tell them, man, please, I have a voice. I have something to, to say. All right? And perhaps also here, you have presumptive attitudes towards other people. You press people down. You don't allow people to speak. And you have your own baseless conclusions. And you even use the word, I know. That's still self-deception. You don't know. When we sit down and when we, when we look down there, we realize David was not wicked. We realize that David was here according to the will of God. Now, let me say something about presumptive attitudes. And this is very important. Presumptive attitudes really come out as a reflection of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. A thief will always be careful lest his or her things are stolen. Because whenever he gets an opportunity, he knows what to do with those things. He steals them. So we, our, the attitudes that are baseless, that are presumptive, are primarily a reflection of the condition of our hearts. And to that, first, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 15 to 16 says, To the pure, all things are 
Can we say it? To the pure, all things are? But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is? Now, this one, the th all things which are poor, pure is not based on either really that truly they are pure. But it's based on the condition of the heart and of the attitude towards that thing and therefore it becomes pure. The Bible says the uh, love covers a multitude of sin. Now, some of us have been wronged badly, but because within us there is that attitude of love, so we even don't see that thing. Even the wrong which people do to us, because we are pure within us, then it becomes pure outside there. You see that? So that presumptive attitude is a reflection of the state of our inner being. To the corrupt and to the unbelieving, everything that they see is corrupted and everything they see is not pure. So whenever you find people really, you know, uh, you, you know, using presumptive attitudes to make conclusions, at the end of the day, it actually speaks of who they are. And that is why Eliab said, I know. It was a statement of fact with Eliab because it was the condition of his heart and the attitude of his heart towards David. But it was not the reality about the condition of the heart of David. You see that? So we need to work on our inside for us to be able to serve the Lord. Now, let me now bring us so fast to the Christian mind. How should our mind uh, be? How should our uh, attitude be? Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5. The Bible says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Can all of us say amen? amen. Tell your friend or your neighbor, I have to think like Jesus. I have to think like Jesus. So our attitude should be like that of Jesus Christ. Now, what is that mind, the attitude we find about Jesus? And uh, when we read Philippians chapter 2 downwards, uh, we, we find the components of what was in the mind of Jesus. The very things which was in the mind of Jesus while he was here on earth. Verse 6 says of chapter 2 of Philippians, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, what does this tell us about the mind of Christ? It tells us or it speaks to us about divinity. Christ was divine. And in his mind, he knew that he was divine. He knew that there was divinity in him. He was divine. He was a divine being. He knew that in his nature, being in the very nature God, you know, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So our mentality should always tell us we are not carnal. We are not natural, but we are spiritual. A Christian mind should have an element of divinity. I am a child of God. I am born again. So in your mind, you should know your status. Who are you in Christ? So every Christian should have that attitude. You know? There are things we don't want to do because we have the attitude. We know who we are. And so... Our Christian mind should have divinity embedded right at the base. We should know that we are not carnal, we are not natural. We are divine. We are the sons and the daughters of God. 
The second component of divinity is servanthood. Our attitude, other than being divine, it also should have the component of servanthood. The Bible says about Jesus, yeah, though he was God, he was in the very nature God, the Bible says in verse 7, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the likeness of man. Servanthood. I like what the Bible uses here, the words. The Bible says, he made himself. That means he consciously chose and said, I am making myself a servant. You know, it's another thing to be a servant because you are made, and it's another thing to become a servant because you made yourself. You are the boss, but you make yourself a servant. That is the attitude, that is the mind of Christ. Servanthood. So brethren, let's humble ourselves. Let's bring down, let's come down from our eye pedestals. And let us make ourselves what? Servants. You know, at times really, <laughs> you know, there are things that really, you know, make us, they fool us. You know, when people are celebrating you, eh? They are doing this, they are clapping, they are saying you are a great man. How do you feel? You feel great, but let me tell you, it's just a balloon. There's no substance in that. Servanthood. Servanthood is key, brethren. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Okay, that's the next thing. You know, let, let's come down. Let's be servants. Hmm? You know, some of us really can, cannot even push a stool, you know? You say, secretary, where are you? I need this tool to be moved. Serious? You think if you move the stool, your dignity falls. Can we say that's nonsense? The warrior is me is coming out down. I feel like fighting someone. You know, please let's stop such nonsense. The Bible says he made himself. And you know what? If you don't make yourself, Life knows how to make you. You can come down and you find yourself you have to sweep and yet really, that will really cut deep into your ego. I don't have issue myself, really. I don't. If you people find me in the farm, hmm? right, remember, anyway, I don't want to tell you that story. <laughs> yeah? I met someone somewhere and then that was before I even came to sit them. And I had preached somewhere. And I meet these ladies somewhere in the market. You know what I had come to do in the market? I had brought my, my, the work of my labor. And so we meet in the marketplace. And he looked at me and said, are you not pastor? Are you not a preacher? I said, yes, I am. You know, when you are now in that business world, you're like, oh, really? So you know that our pastor should be walking. Hello, guys. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Please, that one does not bother me. Seriously, it does not. But it's very good we make ourselves, all right? Let's have this attitude. The third attitude we should have the, uh, that forms the component of, of our faith is humility. Humility. Please. Uh, let's not even say we are humble. Let's just work hard in our secret. You know, we, we, are, we are so arrogant, seriously. At times we speak words, even like preaching now. I go and sit down and I say, why, why, why were you saying now that? I now go and say, I, I, that was a mess, okay? Because we, we, are, we are down, we are just nothing. The Bible says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Look at that again. It's Jesus himself. 
It was his volition. He decides to humble himself. This is the God who made everything. But he himself, in fact, he says, nobody takes away my life in John. He says, I laid it down myself. That is the mind of Christ. And that should be the attitude that we possess. Hmm? You know, if you always remind people, you know I'm the husband. Do you know I'm your husband? It means really you are challenged. <laughs> you have a serious challenge within you. You are like, you are not. Okay? Okay, this is still presumptive, so this is me. People who have money don't parade money. But the people who have just a little money, they would really struggle try to do something so that you know I have money. You know, I will get the best thing that will just try to display and just try to improve my attitude, my, my esteem. Please, tell your, tell your neighbor again, calm down. Calm, calm down, let's calm down. Let's humble ourselves. You know, in humility, you, you don't have to prove. But in pride, you have always to work so hard to maintain the very position you always try to portray. Hmm? Now, if I pride myself I'm the strongest man in Sidon Eldoret, I'll always have to work so hard. But if I come here and I say, oh, I'm not the strongest. I don't have any challenge, you know? <laughs> While you are struggling to fight and do all this, I'm just busy sleeping. When you come and want to fight me, I said, what's the problem? I said I'm the weakest. Go, hello, go, 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 go your way. Humility will give us peace. Go to that office and just humble yourself. Go to that relationship and then just humble. Humble yourself. The final one, the final component of the mind of Christ is obedience. And I will bring uh, this to the close after this. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. The Christian attitude is that of obedience. But are we always getting it right? No, we fall short. Uh, yesterday I was reading uh, to, to our young people where the Bible says, the very thing I hate is what I do. Have you ever read that? Romans 7. The very thing I hate is what I... Hey. In fact, it's not saying the very thing that is hated. It is, it is me who hates it. And who is doing it? Me. So, but deep within us, there is that level of obedience. You say, I want to obey the Lord. I want to do the right thing. And the Bible says, Jesus obeyed to the Lord to the point of the, of the, of, of the, to the, to the point of death, even a death, a, a type of death that he died on the cross. Obedience should be the very thing. Now, when we have the mind of Christ, uh, you know, we will live in love. And the Bible says, let, uh, let, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than can we say that thing again? Okay, can we read this aloud? Because this is very important. This is your take home, all right? This is your homework. Please read this. Let's read it one, two, three, loud. Yes, stop there. In humility, consider others better than? Please, that's not an easy thing. But that's the mind of Christ. That should be the attitude of a Christian. Consider others better than your self. 
Let that thing sink deep within yourself. You are not the best. You're not the best. The Bible says consider others better than yourself. Give opportunity to people. Seriously. Huh? Don't say, if it's not me, it's never done. If it's not me, me, it's never done well. Are you a Christian? No. Consider others to be better than you are yourself. Then another take home. Each of you should look not only for your own interests. You know, you are in a relationship, but you are not for the interests of the other person, but you are coming in subtly with your own interests. The Bible says, look not for your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Please, when we have this, we will solve almost 100% of our relational challenges. When we have the attitude of Christ, that way God will be glorified. And in conclusion, in the King James Version, the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be new, which also was in Christ Jesus. Brethren, that was not a bogus mind. That was the highest mind ever that has ever come on earth. Let this mind be new, which was in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we pray. Please, Lord, we know that you have fallen short of your glory. We have fallen in our attitude. We have fallen in our thinking. Our minds are completely mad with the depravity of our sinful nature. But Lord, I pray today, may this mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. How he humbled himself, though he was in the very nature of God, he humbled himself to the state of a servant, even a human being, and he humbled himself even to a death on the cross as he obeyed you to the very end. Lord, I pray, kindly help us. Kindly help us, Lord, to have the mind of Christ. Forgive our trespasses. Forgive our wickedness. Make us clean according to eternal love and mercy. Lord, we thank you. Perhaps you're here and you feel you want to make something right with God, especially with your attitude. You realize that you need a change over in your attitude. You want to let the mind of Christ come into one or this area of your life. You can lift up your hand again, even as I bring this uh, to a close. Father, we thank you. We humble ourselves, Lord. We lift our hands before you, telling you, God, Father, we need your mind. We need your mind in our relationships. We need your mind in our expressions. We need your mind in our words, in our behavior, and in all that we do, so that your name may be glorified. We thank you and honor you. For this is our prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. And everybody say...